Okay, so good afternoon all. My name is Ria Jen. I am the recruitment advisor for UCL. I deal with UCL applications for SIUK India exclusively. Um, I'm also a UCL alumni. I graduated in 2020 with a degree in LM and my specialization was in competition law. Um, today, we are very delighted to have with us today, Professor Mike Monday. He is the professor of pharmaceutical biochemistry and the director of the MSc Drug Discovery and Development and the MSc Drug Discovery and Pharma Management programs at UCL School of Pharmacy. He is also the Vice Dean of Education for the Faculty of Life Sciences at UCL. Uh, Professor Monday has been a frequent visitor to India at British Council Fairs, visiting colleges, universities, research institutes, and pharma industry. I am uh, also reliably informed that he even sampled the roadside Gannika Ras, uh, which, is pretty, which is pretty exciting and hilarious. Um, we hope he will be able to visit again and look forward to welcoming him to our SIUK offices as well. Uh, Professor Monday, thank you very much for being with us today to talk about the master's programs at the UCL School of Pharmacy. Uh, following his presentation, there will be time for a Q&A as well. Along with Professor Monday, we have Arvind Vepa and Namita Pandey from the UCL student recruitment team who will, assess, who will assist with the Q&A. So please post your questions in the question section. Professor Monday, the screen is yours. Ria, thank you very much indeed. What an introduction. Not, I'm used to having to introduce myself. I certainly don't have to after that. Even reminding me of stories of my time in India, which is, which is excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this presentation. I hope to say a few words about uh, the, the, the taught postgraduate programs um, and, and maybe even a quick word about PhDs for those who are interested um, at UCL School of Pharmacy. Um, and as Ria says, please do ask any questions you have, stick the questions into the chat, and at the end we'll try and, and answer those. Uh, I'll also provide you with a couple of email addresses that you can use as well if you want to get in, in contact with me afterwards. So let me share my screen and uh, let's have a look at the, um, the, the presentation. Okay. Well, so Ria's already introduced me. So I'm Mike Mundy. I'm Professor of Pharmaceutical Biochemistry and Vice Dean of Education for the Faculty of Life Sciences. But I'm speaking today about the MSCs because I've been the director of the two MSC in drug discovery programs. And they, they first came online back in 2003. So 18 years old now is, is the MSC drug discovery. I'll talk in a little bit more detail about that to show you the way MSC programs are organized, certainly at UCL School of Pharmacy and, and, and at UCL in, in general. Well, let's start off with a word about the School of Pharmacy. So the School of Pharmacy then is here on the Bloomsbury uh, campus, which effectively is, is, is the UCL campus, so really. So you'll find the school uh, here. This is, this is the building in Brunswick Square, about 10 minutes walk or so away from, from the, the main campus with the portico and the columns, um, the, the traditional heart uh, of, of UCL. And in this particular area, very nice part of, of London, again, with tree-lined squares, et cetera, but you find bits of, of UCL all over the place. So again, we have the Institute of Child Health here next to Great Ormond Street Hospital. We have the Institute of Neurology here in Queen Square. Um, we have the, the main campus and the main science departments here. We have the medical school over here. So all over this area, you'll find a whole um, range, diverse range of activities, uh, academic activities, halls of residence, libraries, uh, UCL departments uh, and, and buildings. And this area, when you look at London, so here's the tourist map of London, uh, occupies this, this sort of square here. This is the UCL campus that we we're just looking at, the Bloomsbury campus, just north of the main tourist areas in the centre uh, of London here, but very, very close uh, to that central area, 20, uh, 25 minutes walk down into, into the heart of, of London. UCL then is um, very famous uh, and very old university, founded in 1826, the first English university established after Oxford and Cambridge, um, and currently ranked eighth in the, in the world in the, in the QS rankings. Perhaps what some people don't know is two thirds of everything UCL does is biomedical sciences. So again, it's ranked third in the UK for, for biomed science teaching and research. And that's gonna be very relevant to the MSCs that we, we talk about today. 
Last year, there were just under 44,000 students, and there's slightly more postgraduates at the moment than there are undergraduate students. But while it's full of academic uh, endeavor, it's really important to know that there's a, there's a whole set of extracurricular activities that are incredibly well supported and which you're encouraged to, to take part in. So for example, for those that are thinking about you know, getting into pharma industry or drug discovery and, or, or <clears throat> maybe formulation or those sorts of exercises associated with the drug discovery and development process, then innovation and enterprise is very important. And there are various roundtables and groups you can join. And so I picked out here an example, innovation and enterprise. Last year, UCL students participated in 55,000 hours of voluntary work. Mike, said, hey, uh, Mike, could I stop you there for a second? Um, yeah, sure. your, your slides are not shifting. We're just still on slide one. Is it possible if you could like Oh no. The slides. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, let's try. I may have to. Yep, uh, now it's moving. No, it's fine. Now it's moving. Yeah, okay. Maybe could I you yeah. just could you just go back and hit that share button again? I think it's the share that's doing it, Arvind. I'm really sorry. Okay, no, no worries. I'm gonna do it. Yeah, let's let's try like this. Um that, that is a problem I had previously as well. Okay, yeah, no problem. We are currently on the numbers. yeah. We're currently on slide four, the UCL intro. Let's, let, let's okay. Sorry, folks. I didn't realize I wasn't sharing properly. I've shared the first slide and no more. Okay, so ho hopefully you're seeing this now. This was the Bloomsbury campus that I was talking about, and so here is um, the School of Pharmacy <clears throat> in Brunswick Square, a short distance from UCL main campus. I'm making the point that the whole of this. Um, Bloomsbury campus is full of uh, academic enterprise and, and endeavor. So various UCL departments there. Um, the medical school is down here, Institute of Child Health and uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital is, uh, is here. And there are libraries and halls of residence all over this very pleasant part of London uh, called Bloomsbury. And my next point was, well, this area, if one is looking at a, um, tourist map of London. So hopefully the slide has changed, David, yeah? Yes, it's changed. Good. So the tourist map of London then just shows you that this area of UCL and is just to the north of the main center, a short 20, 25 minutes walk down into, into, into central London. Okay, so UCL, a, a, an old university, the, the first established after Oxford and Cambridge since 1826, high in the world rankings, eighth currently in QS world ranking, two thirds of everything that's done there is, is biomedical sciences. And as I said last year, it's 44,000 near enough students with slightly more postgraduates than undergraduates, but the extracurricular activities and innovation and enterprise will be of interest to, to, to many is, is one of those saying that last year students participated in a large number of hours of voluntary work, 55,000, set up 80 different social enterprises, 61 startup businesses. And I think that's important in terms of coming and making the most of UCL uh, and, and being able to participate in, in such things. UCL prides itself on being a global university. So students from 190 different countries study at UCL, that creates this worldwide network uh, of more than a quarter of a million uh, UCL alumni, again, and many of whom I've met on various travels around the world, including India. And it's that, that's a really important network uh, to become part of uh, as well. It maintains the UCL presence, I think, uh, around the world um, and really confirms the reputation for, for uh, excellence. Why is UCL School of Pharmacy special? So I'll say a word or two about um, where, where the degree programs we're discussing today are based. This is the oldest school of pharmacy uh, established in 1842. It has always been a specialist school dedicated to teaching and research in pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences. It's currently ranked seventh in the world in the QS rankings for pharmacy and pharmacology. Um, but it's only undergraduate degree is pharmacy degree, but the master's programs again, dedicated to clinical pharmacy, pharmacy related again, and pharmaceutical science. 
And the school has expanded its master's program over this period, 1995 to, to 2020. So over those 25 years, it's been actively engaged in increasing the numbers of taught postgraduate students, increasing that cohort within the school. And this is one of my favorite graphs that shows um, that, that work in the last 15 years or so that, that I've been uh, specifically in, involved in it. And these are the numbers of taught master's students in the school. And it's increased so much that it's off the scale now. I have to redraw this graph really at some point. But last year in, in 2020, um, we were in the mid, mid 200s, um, well over 250 students that had come to study in the various MSc programs. What are these um, postgraduate programs that are offered? So the MSc programs are one year taught postgraduate courses. And here is a, a list of those. So clinical pharmacy, international practice and policy um, is, a, is a program for, for pharmacists. I'll tell you a little bit about each of these uh, in a moment. This now also has a, a kind of uh, another stream in that you can take this clinical pharmacy, international practice and policy MSc with an extended six month placement uh, working in clinical pharmacy in a, in a hospital here in London. We have drug discovery and development, the MSc in drug discovery and pharma management, the MSc in pharmaceutics, MSc in pharmaceutical formulation and entrepreneurship, and the MSc in experimental pharmacology and therapeutics. This is taught jointly with the division of biosciences uh, within our faculty. And then there's a master's by research, so an MRes in pharmaceutical um, science, again, which I'll talk briefly about. And then, of course, the three year postgraduate research PhDs. So looking at each of those in turn, then the MRes in pharmaceutical science covers a diverse range of research subjects. So effectively, students choose their subject area and their research supervisor and what particular area they would want to work in. So it may be microbiology, it might be toxicology, it could be drug discovery, it could be drug delivery, it might be pharmacology. Uh, the, the student will decide as if they were, as, just as they may choose if, if they were choosing a PhD research area. The difference about the with the MRes is that eighty percent of it is research, so it is like a mini PhD. So the the actual content of this program is eighty percent research carried out in the laboratory with a research supervisor and the other research workers in that group, and then twenty percent of the course comes from taught modules chosen from the student take, cho chosen by the student taken from other uh, other programs other MSc programs. There is a very important and integrated training program as well. So you will be trained in research skills, there are research days, there's presentation skills, there's writing skills as well. So there's a training program associated uh, with the, the MRes. Moving back then into the MSc list. So the first I talked about was the MSc in clinical pharmacy, international practice and policy. This is for people who are already qualified pharmacists working as uh, hopefully in, in pharmacy somewhere or other who want to develop their clinical expertise in therapeutics and pharmacy practice, who would like to see the way the health system works, uh, particularly in the, in, obviously in the UK, but maybe learn from others who are in the course as well. It will concentrate on things like leadership development. It looks at therapeutic areas prioritized by the World Health Organization. It looks at clinical and health services research methods as well. Students on this course spend at least two to three days per week throughout the program at one of, their, one of our partner hospital sites uh, gaining this expertise. And there is a research skills project as well, uh, which involves a clinical placement in one of the leading London hospitals. This program now has an additional component for those who want to uh, register on it, and that's the ability to stay an extra six months in a placement. So if you're looking for a longer term um, clinical practice uh, experience and then being able to develop further skills in medicines optimization and, and the governance skills, then it's possible to, to have the MSc in clinical pharmacy with an extra six month placement. The MSc in pharmaceutics uh, looks at the requirements of the pharma industry for highly skilled formulation scientists. So those who are capable of taking uh, a new uh, medical entity, a new drug molecule, and developing it into a, a world-class medicine. Because drug delivery systems are so important, again, especially these days when there are so many biological molecules out there uh, as well. So it's a small part of the whole drug development uh, process, but an absolutely critical one as well. So you look at the core, uh, core modules, and they'll be looking at uh, 
material science and pre-formulation and formulation and analysis, looking at biotech as well. And then some of those optional modules means you could specialize in clinical pharmaceutics or maybe in nanomedicines as well, uh, even in formulation of natural products and cosmeceuticals. And then the, the kind of companion or, or, the, or the sister course to this is the MSc in pharmaceutical formulation and entrepreneurship. So again, it will combine the scientific knowledge that we've seen. So some of those core modules are, are, are quite similar and some of the optional modules are the same um, with the MSc in pharmaceutics. But now it's looking at for graduates who want to combine this scientific knowledge with, a, with an entrepreneurial ambition, who maybe hope to set up their own companies, who will be interested in commercializing research uh, and, and join startup companies or join existing biotech. Uh, pharma companies as well. So it's the knowledge of entrepreneurship and the business side of, of small company formation. The MSc in Experimental Pharmacology and Therapeutics uh, addresses a, a gap in the pharma industry, which is people with good knowledge of pharmacological experimental uh, techniques. So it's going to teach advanced experimental and technical expertise in pharmacology in preparation for going to work in the pharma industry or perhaps pursuing PhD studies. So it is very experimentally based. There's a lot of lab work here as well. The lab-based research project is, is longer than usual, so the, the lab-based research project uh, goes on for, for, for 10 months. But there are various optional modules that you can pair with the, the core modules around the experimental region, like neuropharmacology and psychopharmacology, you know, drug discovery and clinical developments in there as well. So there are a number of different modules, um, all pharmacologically related, which will then support this, this knowledge that will be gained in experimental pharmacology. And then the two that I know most about, because these are the two that I've uh, been director of since uh, 2003, uh, the, the two MSc drug discovery programs. So the MSc in drug discovery and development is an overview of the drug discovery and development pro process, but a, a, an in-depth look at drug discovery science. Um, this program probably should be called drug discovery science um, because it then looks at personalized medicines, biomarkers and diagnostics, immunotherapies, uh, advanced drug design um, as well. So for those with a real interest in getting deeper into the science of drug discovery, uh, as well as having a broad overview, this, this is a, a good MSc. But there are also those who think that they would like to take that scientific expertise and apply it in the management set, um, situation. So we have the MSc in drug discovery and pharma management, which also gives an overview of the drug discovery and development process, but gives an extra focus on those management issues like global drug licensing and regulatory affairs, commercializing research, intellectual property, consultancy, entrepreneurship are all in the pharma management part of this stream. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the MSc in drug discovery to sort of show its structure. And this MSc is based on this, the pipeline of drug discovery and development. So for those of you who've studied any at all in this area so far, you'll know that we start here at the left-hand side with a therapeutic concept, effectively, what is the disease and where is there an unmet clinical need that we need to, 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 to address. And once we decide on a therapeutic concept, we'll go through selecting the target, validating the target, trying to discover a lead compound or maybe finding out which biological molecule we're going to develop, optimizing that lead, and then taking into preclinical development, looking at bioavailability in animal models, looking at toxicology, uh, and looking at how we're going to start formulating that into a medicine before we then take it into humans in clinical trials, and then eventually obtaining a, a license for that regulatory affairs as a drug licensing process. And so eventually we find ourselves at the end of the pipeline here, with a commercial product which is being used uh, clinically out, out there uh, in, in the world. <clears throat> and this is exciting times, I think, for, for a, a changing world in terms of drug discovery, because globalization is making people richer and healthier as well. The, school, the, the, the world's population is increasing and it's causing the emergence of a really global market with a very rapidly expanding patient base. Um, the population will be 8 to 10 billion by 2050, and that population is living longer as well. So the aging population is also creating unmet clinical needs around chronic clinical conditions. 
So dementia and diabetes and cancer, those sorts of things which come with living longer are, are producing new unmet clinical needs, which the drug discovery process needs to address. Wealth demands improved health as well. So the wealthier we are, then, then the better we can afford it. And for example, 20 years ago, 20% uh, of Asia was considered middle class. Today, 56% is considered middle class. So there is, it doesn't always feel like it, but there is increasing wealth within the world. And that does will demand better health and improved health. So the pharma industry is growing in emerging markets three times faster than established ones. And that's interesting that by 2030, for example, patients with diabetes will increase from 285 million to 438 million, but, but a third of all those patients will be found in, in India and, and China. So emerging markets are very interesting and, and, a, and a, an area for lots of work. Orphan disease is becoming more important. Things that in the past farm industry shied away from are now uh, getting attention. So whether it's dengue fever or Ebola, COVID-19 obviously is a, is a, is a new disease, but tuberculosis, which hadn't been looked at for a while, are now posing challenges, um, as does the supply of medicines uh, to, to, to address some of those diseases as well. And what pharma industry agrees is there are serious research and development shortfalls. There's not enough products in the discovery pipeline. And so there's some emphasis on repurposing drugs and reformulating drugs. There's new technology as well, though. So a large number of new medical entities are biological molecules. They require special production, special formulation. Um, as the patents run out on those, they're taken over by biosimilars. But biosimilars still require production in, uh, in, in biological uh, systems which, which are again technically challenging and then we have the advanced therapeutic medicinal products the ATMPs again CAR T cell therapy is one that's out there and gene therapy using things like CRISPR technology is out there tissue engineering being able to grow new tissues uh, for transplant all difficult to develop all very costly but all very exciting in the impact they're having on human health pharmacogenomics is important personalized medicine also not just personalized medicines, but also personalized dosing as well, requires us to be able to sort out patients into groups. So diagnosis has got to be stratified. We've got to stratify our groups. That allows us to do focused clinical trials, see who will benefit. We all need biomarkers, we need companion diagnostics for this. Drug licensing and clinical trials or regulatory affairs are all global issues. Nobody uh, markets a drug in a single country anymore. So getting drug licenses across the globe uh, are really important. And of course, there are challenges to that as well. So when you lose the patent on a drug, then the generic alternative then becomes freely available and much more uh, less expensive as, as well. Biosimilars are the similar thing for the biologicals. Counterfeit medicines are also a problem that they're getting into the supply chain and compromising both therapy and um, the, the, um, <clears throat> the business models for, for pharma industry as well. Finally, embracing new technology is really important. So digital health, uh, the use of artificial intelligence in diagnosis in discovery in marketing in monitoring uh, are all really important. So 10 good reasons why the drug discovery and development process is, is, is interesting at the moment. And in the MSc program, these two guys have both been there and done it and both teach on this course. So Professor Nigel Ratcliffe was a former vice president for regulatory and commercial affairs at AstraZeneca. Uh, Dr. Phil Holt was the global product director at AstraZeneca as well. They're currently both CEOs of their own consultancies and they teach extensively on the MSC drug discovery. And they say pharma industry has got to improve its productivity and its R&D investment. The R&D pipeline is, is an absolute priority. And to maintain that, what do we have to do is start to outsource and uh, externalize. In other words, not everything can be done by big pharma industry, but they will pay smaller companies to do it. And a good friend of mine, Professor Bill Charman, head of pharmacy at Monash University um, until last year when he retired, but in 2018, he reckoned that 75% of pharma activity 
um, was being sourced, uh, sourced externally. In other words, Big Pharma was outsourcing to smaller companies. So there's never been a better time for collaborations and partnerships. There's a real opportunity for small companies for entrepreneurship to feed into the drug discovery uh, pathway. And that's what we see really. That drug discovery pipeline really looks like this these days. That there are small companies, biopharma companies, bioincubators, spin out companies, CROs, clinical trial consultancies, all feeding like uh, small streams into that major, major pipeline. Um, a lot of the work is done out there, and that's producing lots of opportunity in pharma industry um, for, for students who want to get involved, uh, who, want, who want to be employed, and want to get into the pharma um, drug discovery and development process. So back to the MSc. The MSc in drug discovery at the UCL School of Pharmacy then is based on the pipeline. And so through the center here in yellow, the two core modules are taken by both programs, whether it's MSc Drug Discovery and Development or MSc Drug Discovery and Pharma Management. And that really concentrates on that pipeline. In the first term from October to January, there's another module called Modern Aspects of Drug Discovery, which complements the core module, the process uh, of drug discovery. And then in the, in the second term, January to April, with the process of drug development core module, if you're studying pharma management, then there's a pharma management module that accompanies that. If, you discover, if you're studying drug discovery and development, then you choose two specialist science modules. Could be anti-cancer personalized medicines, could be translational neuroscience, pharmacogenomics and biomarkers, applications of immunotherapy and vaccines, could be advanced structure, based drug design could be pharmacometrics. So two of these modules then accompany this core module if you're studying the more science-based drug discovery and development. And from May through till September, we have the research project. Again, if you're science-based, you'd probably be expecting to go into a laboratory-based research product, uh, project. If you're studying pharma management, you're probably going to look at a, a management or business development research project that will be analyzing data from, from published sources. That is the kind of module pattern you'll see across the UCL uh, MSCs and certainly at UCL School of Pharmacy. So I use drug discovery as the example here, but uh, there's the equivalent of sort of um, 120 credits as it were, so 230 credit modules, and then either 230 credits or a 30 and 215s are the taught component in the first two thirds of the year. And then the final third of the academic year is spent in, in a research um, project, which is a further 60 credits. So this represents one third of the material, this represents one third of the material, this represents one third of the material. The approaches to learning are varied. So I think it's really important that students get to do a whole set of activities. So there are lectures in there, there are practical and skill classes, there are some online materials, but there are tutorials, seminars, workshop, group work, oral presentation, of course, independent study is important. Research project is very important, but we also try and get you out there on visits to industry, attending a conference. Again, if you're in the clinical MSc, hospital placement becomes really important. And what's been really important, I think, to all of these courses, not just drug discovery, but all of them, is the way that they interact with employers. So the employed nature, the, the outward facing nature of the MSc is, is, is really important. And so here's just some of the people that engage uh, with the, the program. They may, people from these organizations may come in and teach. Many of them do. Many others offer research placements and, and projects as well. And everything from, from big pharma like GSK, and Novartis and Pfizer to smaller uh, biotech companies, Polytherix, Pharmadex is in there as well, um, to some of the uh, important government organizations, whether it's NHS or MHRA as the drug regulators, um, charities as well, Cancer Research the UK. So you can see there's a whole range of different uh, professionals out there that come and engage with the course. And it's really important to, to have them uh, contributing so that we understand exactly what's going out there uh, in the moment, uh, at this moment in terms of drug discovery and development. And again, back to MSC and drug discovery, here's just a list of some of those people that are doing, engaged in teaching. So it's no small number at all. Nigel Ratcliffe and Phil Holt, you've met already. Um, but Clara Valco, for example, comes from GSK. Georgina comes from Roche. 
dealing with clinical pharmacology. And as you run down the list, Gershley is CEO of a small biotech company, Gardram Therapeutics. Um, Mike Brownlee, the CEO of Generon. Um, we have uh, Dan O'Connor working for uh, regulatory affairs in MHRA. Danny Yaya, who's a farmer and marketing in Johnson & Johnson. There's a whole range of people in there coming from these different professional bodies that actually teach on the course and also offer research projects. What do those research projects look like? So again, MSC Drug Discovery is the easiest for me to explain, but the MSC Drug Discovery and Development, these are some of the sort of science-based projects you might be involved in. So screening fragment-based libraries as inhibitors of kinesins. Kinesins are these motor proteins involved in cell division, and so they are anti-cancer targets. Epigenetic drug targets, um, astrocyte culture in 3D, so a neuropharmacology type course, nano-enabled drug del uh, delivery of, of drugs, um, drug metabolism and animal models of diabetes, um, molecular docking. So it doesn't have to be laboratory based. It could be computer based with some in silico um, drug design type project as well. So a whole range of different drug discovery and development uh, projects that are available in laboratories at UCL and sometimes also available in laboratories of uh, the companies as well. So this one here, characterization of in gel protein stain was actually available at Generon, uh, one of the small companies. And then in terms of pharma management, anything related to the management or business um, side of, of drug discovery is, is possible. Here's just some of the examples that students have come up with, uh, like comparison, comparison of drug licensing processes, China and Europe, crowdfunding as a means of generating capital for startup companies, um, the roles of bioincubators and biocatalysts and the launch of small companies. Um, social media down here as a pharmaceutical marketing channel. Um, advances and challenges in the development of an Ebola vaccine. More recently, people have sort of turned that to COVID vaccines. So they've been the projects that, that we've had in the last uh, year or so, definitely. Interpretations of finance in the NHS, National Health Service. Um, EU directives, falsified medicines, looking at uh, counterfeit medicines, uh, clinical trials projects, the one at the bottom, importance of site selection for a so successful multi-center clinical trial study. So any aspect of, of drug discovery that uh, relates to, to, to management or business um, could be chosen. Then the data for this comes from company reports and published materials, maybe from surveys of professionals or surveys of of patients as well, possibly from clinical records. So this is still a data-based exercise. It's just not generated in the laboratory, it's generated by interrogating databases and reports. At the end of these projects, we have a, um, we have a, a, a conference effectively. So every student then presents, this is from 2018. So here's the class of 2018-19, again, at the, their research conference at the end of their um, research projects, they come together. This is the main lecture theatre at UCL School of Pharmacy. And uh, over the course of the week, each one of those students you see there on the, uh, on, on the slide has presented the work that they've done in their three months, four month uh, research project. Just to finish off a quick word then about uh, what the School of Pharmacy at UCL uh, and, and quick word about PhDs as well. So in the School of Pharmacy, there's about 250 staff, 60 of those are, are academic members of staff. There are about 800 undergraduates on, a, on the undergraduate pharmacy program and postgraduate MSCs and MRAs are currently in about the mid 200s, 220, maybe slightly more. Um, there are about 150 postgraduates uh, carrying out PhDs as well. And again, I put the percentage of international students there as well. So um, we are very proud of the fact that we have a large number of international students. It's just over 30% of international students on the undergraduate program. But the MSc is, is nearly two thirds international, 60% international, and about a third of the PhD students uh, international um, as well. The, um, the School of Pharmacy then has an outstanding record of excellence in research with a structured PhD program. The facilities, both for teaching and research, are, are excellent. The research profile is good. 87% of the staff there 
were rated world leading or internationally excellent in the last government assessment of research. And so there are PhD opportunities. Funding is usually the biggest problem. So again, um, coming, try, try to find funding um, from research groups themselves is, is, is quite difficult. But for students who have scholarships, then that becomes much, much easier. And so the actual um, availability of places within laboratories is, is, is much less of a problem, certainly if, if you have a scholarship to go with that. The School of Pharmacy at UCL is also part of the Farm Alliance Partnership. This is a partnership between two, uh, three major schools of pharmacy across the world. So uh, the University of North Carolina at uh, Chapel Hill in the United States, Monash University down in Melbourne in Australia, and UCL form this Farm Alliance Partnership. And this works collaborative, collaboratively in research um, and in teaching as well. And so we are keen to, to develop links and to develop research links as well. So it's possible when carrying out those MSc research projects to, to carry it out somewhere else in the world. And we are looking at possibilities at the moment of, of exchange. Um, we've done some at the undergraduate level, um, we've done some at PhD level. It would be quite nice to get MSCs exchanged with these um, the, the other two members of this uh, partnership. And so finally, in terms of research, Within the School of Pharmacy, these are the six areas that, that, uh, that, that the School of Pharmacy works upon. And so your particular MSc research project would be associated with one of these. And if you're looking to move on into PhD study, then these would be one of the six areas that you'll find available at the School of Pharmacy. So drug discovery and therapeutic target identification, quite clearly um, our, our MSCs, the MSc drug discovery fits within that. Age-related medicines development and use, pharmacoepidemiology and medicine safety, certainly for those of clinical interest. Translational neuroscience would be a big area. But again, for those interested in the experimental pharmacology MSc, they are likely to find projects in that area. Fabrication and synthetic technologies for advanced, advanced drug delivery associated with the MSc uh, pharmaceutics, medicines use and optimization. Uh, again, similarly. So these are areas for PhD research. Um, if, if you're looking at, at PhDs, then go to the website and look up these areas and see what kind of research is going on within these research clusters within the school. So finally, thank you very much for your, your attention today and, and, and um, following this presentation. If you have questions, then please do post them now and I will try and uh, try and answer them now uh, online. If these questions occur to you uh, in, in the days to come, then, then do feel free to email me. That's my email address on screen there at the moment. And also the taught postgraduate group in the teaching office at the School of Pharmacy. That is their email address, sop.pgt, who will also be happy to, uh, to, to answer any questions you might have uh, of a more general nature. So, Ria, back to you. Okay, thank you so much for that. It was incredibly insightful. So let's open the floor to Q&A. So the first question is, what is the process to opt the placement options? Would I be able to choose the specialization during my first term? So in the placement options then, um, the, the, it, it, is, it is just about now. So we're in the first term now, and it's this week and next week, we start to talk to students about what their interests are and where they would like to do um, research projects, what, what they have in mind. And there are, various, there are various possibilities. So some companies, there are a number of companies who will provide a list of projects that, that they have on offer. And so students are invited to apply for those projects with companies. And some of them are small companies that I've talked about, but there are also some big companies like Roche and GSK in the past, Pfizer as well, that, that put up projects for offer. The student might be interviewed by the company. They're almost certainly gonna to have to sort of write a letter or a short CV, um, or one page application. But, but so there are some placements that are offered by, by the companies. Um, there will be a number of research projects that are offered by UCL itself. So the laboratory research, research projects are a whole list of those that students can choose. But we're also keen to get students' own ideas about what they would like to follow. So again, we have students that have their own ideas about comparing, for example, drug regulation in one country versus another. 
who'd like to see the response to um, outbreaks. Uh, so how, how did the world respond to the Ebola outbreak, for example, was a student idea. Um, so, and students sometimes have their own contacts. So we did have a student once who's, uh, whose uncle was a CEO of a small company. So she went in and that did a business case analysis of, of, of his company as well. We've had students who are interested in sort of natural products. So we had a student from India who was particularly interested in, in a herbal product used in wound healing, who wanted to come and try it in some inflammatory assays in the laboratory. So we will encourage students, if they have their own ideas, um, to, to see if we can develop those into research projects. In many cases, where they are sort of pharma management business type projects, we will, we will endeavor to get external advisors as well. So while everybody will have an academic advisor from UCL on how to conduct the project, um, if you're interested in, for example, I don't counterfeit medicines, then I have a good friend at Oxford University who's an expert in this. And so he, will, he was happy to be the, um, the, the advisor who will give students advice on where to find information and, and what might be interesting things to look at. So that's a rather long explanation, but we will work with the students very closely to make sure that you get the project that you want to and you're working in an area that interests you. It may be that you want to apply and, and, or, or, or um, choose UCL projects or company projects, um, but wherever possible, we'll try and work with you to develop your own project. Okay, great. That's fantastic. So the second question is then, um, I'm currently pursuing a dual degree in B Pharm and MBA Pharmatech in Mumbai. Um, would applying for MSc drug discovery and development be suitable or MSc drug discovery and management be better? Um, I, th I think it depends on where you see your career pathway going and, and what you hope to do um, at the end of the, the MSc, it, it tends to be those that think they're going off to do PhDs and do more science will probably do drug discovery and development. And those who think that they're, they're headed for uh, management roles within pharma industry, be it in drug licensing or clinical trials or, or sometimes marketing, finance, et cetera, would prefer to take the pharma management stream because there, there's a lot more there's a, a, a lot more an in-depth study of, of the management side of things. I don't think it really matters um, because we've had management students who then decided to go back to the laboratory and do science-based PhDs. And we've had drug discovery and development who studied sort of science in depth, who then gone back and done sort of management role, roles within the pharma industry. So it's not as if you're closing any doors by choosing one or the other. But I would my, my recommendation would be to choose on the basis of your interest. So if you love all things, if you love things management and, and, and business orientated, then you're going to love the the the, the pharma management uh, stream of the MSc. Um, but if you if you love the science side, well, we'll take development because those two programs share uh, a lot of teaching and are, pre are very very similar in the first uh, term between October and December, it is possible to switch backwards and forwards from one to the other. Um, UCL don't like it, but it's okay, we, we, we fix that. So it's, the, so it's not a problem. So we have students who come on one course and then think, oh, I wish I'd done the management. It's not, it's not difficult in the first term. It only becomes difficult in the second term when we have the specialist uh, modules. So, so I think the long answer is choo choose for what you're interested in, definitely with a view to where you think you might end up afterwards. Um, but, it, but it is not an irreversible uh, choice. Okay, all right. And uh, the, the next question that we have is, um, I would like to know about the job prospects and chances as a non-EU student in the UK, in the pharmaceutical industry. So, um, well, if I get this wrong, Arvind will correct me, I'm sure. But, but the, the post-study work visa has, has always been a, a big issue. And um, our previous prime minister uh, stopped this back in 2012, which many of us were never very happy about. Um, but uh, for, for all Boris Johnson's faults, the one good thing he has done is brought it back again. So as I understand it, um, graduates from, from 
<clears throat> or future graduates from programs like MSG Drug Discovery will have an automatic uh, two-year post-study work visa again, which allows them to, to look for employment. And that was always one of the great successes of the courses pre-2012 as well, in that I could quote many, many examples of students who had uh, who had stayed on for, for those two years and, and got jobs with, with companies during that time. And once you prove your worth, once you're on that pathway, then it is much easier to apply for the next job. So I'm linked. I'm linked to virtually every one of the graduates, I guess, from this program. There must be nearly a thousand of them over the uh, over the last eighteen years. And when you look at LinkedIn profiles, it is really interesting because students sort of move from one job to to the next fairly rapidly within sort of every two years, three year so period. And so that that accumulation of experience is is. Um, is, is really important. And I think what we have now for international students is the ability to get back onto that, um, that, that development pathway, really. So with that two year visa, you then have the, the chance to get that first job. And there are lots of opportunities out there. Again, they tend to be with the small companies, but there's lots of employment from consultancies and, and small companies. And many of the people, the names that I've listed in that presentation and others that you'd meet on this program, uh, are the future employers as well. They'll, they'll come back to the programs that they're involved with. And so we, we have a lot of students each year that are actually recruited by the people that they've met um, in, the, in that course as well. So I, I, think, I think the prospects are good. There are lots of good examples from, from students who've wanted to, and, and now, now we have the visa capability for students to, to, to get onto that, that career pathway. Um, thing, things are looking positive. All right, great. And uh, Priya, if I may just interrupt and follow yeah, on ahead. from what Mike has said about the graduate route, uh, UCL also sponsors students for what is known as the uh, startup visa. And that's a category of visa uh, for students. It used to be known as the old graduate entrepreneur visa. So this is for UCL graduates who wish to develop their ideas or skills by setting up a business in the UK. And uh, so this is a one year, uh, one off, two year visa, and uh, UCL is happy to support students for this category as well if they have this idea. So what I'll do is I'll post the uh, link on the chat, which can be viewed by all in this session. Thank you. Thanks, Holland. Okay, so I let's move on to the next question then, because we have quite a few. Um, so the next question is: Are the research project placements restricted to those pursuing MRes? Or would students studying the MSc drug discovery and development would get such opportunities to leading to an employment? So, so the internship placements, um, so just be careful of, of my terminology here. So, so within the MSCs, within the MSc programs, it is possible to do external placements. So the research project, which runs from May through till September, so it's about four four and a half months total, it is possible to have external placements for those. And each individual MSc has its own contacts. So the MSc Drug Discovery has a set of contacts and will have a set of external placements uh, e e each year. The MRes is, um, it, is probably best thought of as a mini PhD almost. So 10 months of concentrated research within the laboratory uh, at uh, at, at UCL, and it may be possible that that is done collaboratively with a the industrial with an industrial partner or with one that, with some external organisation. But that M Res really is for negotiation with the individual supervisor. So it depends what the supervisor's contacts are or, or the way the supervisor sees the, the project uh, developing. There's not necessarily a um, an external placement opportunity in the M Res. In, in pharmaceutical science. But there are a number of external placement opportunities um, within each of the MSCs. MSC Drug Discovery certainly has a lot of them. Internship is very often used then to, 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 to mean um, the, the sort of training programs that students can progress onto at the end of master's programs. So again, some of the big pharma have these internship programs. We usually end up with three or four students from drug discovery each year on these. Pfizer run them, Roche run them, I think GSK has one as well. And these are where students then sort of sign up with a big pharma company for a, a sort of a two-year program. They tend to move from department to department 
um, and getting experience within the, within the company. Um, and so when you read about farm industry internship programs, that's usually what they mean. We have sometimes managed to get um, the, the first, the, the, the external placement uh, that, that's part of the MSc as part of an internship program as well. So we've had some students start their internship programs and be able to use the first three, four months as external placement, but that, that is sort of for negotiation with whichever particular MSc you're part of. So external placements for the projects, yes, and they sort of live with each of the MSCs. Internships are the sort of big pharma training programs that, that happen afterwards. MRES is lab-based research, and again, it will be individually worked out with a supervisor what collaborative projects there might be with, with external bodies. Okay, and uh, right. And then the next question is, what, what would you see in a candidate applying for the MSc Drug Discovery and Development? Like, is there something specific that you would want in their personal statement? That's a good question. Excellent. And so it's reminded me of something to say. Yeah, so, so in the application process, it's, it's based on, obviously, academic ability. So the student will be made an offer and, and a, a level to achieve. And that level is the equivalent of second class uh, honours degree in a science subject in, in the UK. So there is a body called NARIC, which will do translations and, and tell you what percentage or what grade point average that actually means in the degree programme that you're studying. And so UCL would make the offer based on that. Um, referees are important. So obviously you, you want the referee to say uh, something nice about you. And of course, English language proficiency is important for international students. So they would be uh, uh, required to demonstrate a, an IELTS standard or Duolingo or TOEFL or one of the English language requirements. And therefore the, the fourth and then final um, criteria is the personal statement. And I think what, what is really important in the personal statement is to sort of say where you've come from and where and where you think you're going and why the program would be important to you. So again, in, in drug discovery, it's, it's what would you do with this MSc? What do you think um, your end goal is? Are you going off to work in some particular area of the pharma industry, you hope? Or is it small biotech you want to get into? Or do you want to go and do a PhD? I think the, um, the, the kind of the, 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 the outcome is, is probably the most important thing. So it doesn't need, doesn't need um, quotes from international figures or past well-known figures, etc. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to, you know, a, a detailed description of everything you've ever studied and how much you liked it. But I think um, the, the personal statement, what is particularly looked for is, is where have you been so far and where do you think you're going and how is this MSc going to help you to do it? So it doesn't need to be pages and pages, you know, half half a page to, to, to one page is, is more than enough in, in the personal statement, but concentrate on how this program is going to help you. Okay, that's great. And uh, just one more question is that, um, are there any programs in your department where you're looking for work experience? And if the student does not have that work experience, does that, would you advise them perhaps not to apply to that specific program? No, I don't think, I, I mean, sometimes work experience helps students who've, um, so, so we've had students who've sort of been away from university study for many years. Um, and again, I can think of some examples, some who've worked as drug reps um, for, for big companies, but, but hadn't been anywhere near sort of science subjects for, for many years is, is one example which springs to mind. And I think if they have some relevant experience, that kind of helps. So we kind of worry if somebody hasn't sort of done any uh, chemistry or biology or something scientific uh, over a long period of time. But if they've been working in something related to the, to the subject area, then, then that helps. That helps sort of convince that, that they'll be able to, uh, to, to catch up and, and, and get involved. But if you haven't, it doesn't really, doesn't really make a big difference because I think what, for example, the MSc and Drug Discovery uh, programs have always aimed to do with, is, to, is to provide a broad overview of the, of the drug discovery and development process so that people can transition from one particular subject area into drug discovery and development. So the students that we have on the course, um, there are 99 students this year on those two programs. But when you look through their, their, 
the, the past degree lists, you'll see all sorts of things. There will be some that have done pharmacy, there'll be some that have done pharmaceutical science, but there'll be chemists, biologists, biochemists, pharmacologists, we've had medics, we've had veterinary science, we've had agri agricultural science, had a dentist as well one year. Um, so, so the background, it, it, as long as there's some basic science in there, you'll be able to cope with the course. And the kind of hope intention of the course is to allow people to transition from one field to another. So if you don't have experience, no, it doesn't really matter. Um, as long as you have some experience of science, that will be sufficient. Okay, and uh, right, and then the next question is, um, would you say that work experience or is necessary for the clinical pharmacy program? Because I think you did mention that before as well, right? Yeah, so, so the clinical pharmacy program requires that everybody is, is a, uh, a qualified pharmacist. And if they've had, if, if, if the applicants have had at least a year's experience of working in pharmacy um, somewhere or other, then that is a big advantage because that program wants to compare um, health services and, and, and systems of operation. Uh, it, it, it does it, it has one of those modules looks at sort of uh, health systems around the globe as well. So I, they, they think that the, the most benefit is gained by those who have at least had a little bit of experience in pharmacy. Having said that, I think they do um, also accept newly qualified pharmacists, but, but, but you, you have to be qualified to, to get onto that, uh, to, to get onto that program. But I think, I think they have, they do now also accept um, students or applicants who might not have had extensive experience working in pharmacy, but, how, but who are at least qualified pharmacists. All right. And the, the next question that we have is, would you recommend applying to two programs or would you prefer that the applicant just apply to one specific program? Well, I, I mean, I, I think, yeah, you, you can apply to, to more than one program, but I would probably, it, I, it, there is a fee. So UCL have a fee, an application fee associated with the process as well. And so to, to be honest, if you've applied to one, you kind of probably are automatically going to get in the other if you change your mind. So um, I, I, my, my, my recommendation is, is choose one and go for it. I mean, I've, I've seen people apply to both of these MSc drug discovery programs, and that really was was just just a waste of fee, really, because if you're in one, you can automatically switch to the other anyway. And we do sort of, when we get close to enrollment time in September, occasionally there's a student who said, "Oh, look, I'm on pharmaceutics, but I've had another in-depth look at the program, and I think I like drug discovery better. Can I transfer across?" And that's just done internally within UCL. So there's not really a great, it's not as if you're sort of increasing your chances by applying to, to multiple programs. My advice was, was choose one. If you then decide later, oh, I wish I, I wish I hadn't chosen drug discovery, I'd rather do Stutics, then the, the transfer is, is easily achieved within, within UCL and you'll save yourself the, the cost of multiple application fees. Okay, that's great. And uh, I think that's all the questions we have. We do not have more questions coming in. Uh, that was our last question, I believe. Right. All right, so I think we are done with the event then. Uh, okay. should, there are no questions left, I believe. So, uh, so thank you very much. That was an incredibly insightful presentation. Um, and uh, would Arvind or Namita like to come in and say a few words as well? Uh, just to reiterate, uh, Mike, thank you very much for the oversight of the MSc programs. And uh, for the students who are applying, or who are in the process of starting the application process, please review the uh, prospectus and study carefully in detail the course content, uh, the modules and the structure of the program. I mean, that's very important. And uh, again, as Mike mentioned, focus on the personal statement, a um, bit about your background, uh, what skill sets you're bringing with you. If you've got 
any research experience or you've written a published a paper or you've done some specific project what is it you learned out of that uh, how you think those skills are going to complement and support your application to the program and more importantly where do you see yourself going with it um, i think that's one of the key things and the personal statement does play an important part in the overall process um, so do your research diligently uh, plan ahead of time and make sure you submit your application in time as well and uh, before you ask and i know this is a question that gets asked quite often how soon will i receive a response uh, we do attract a very high volume of applications um, for our programs so it can take some time uh, till you hear back from us and all i would request is uh, please be patient um, if you submitted the application we will get back to you with the decision um, so thanks for coming in today and um, good luck good luck with your application and good luck with the rest of your degree programs for those of you who are in your final year and uh, stay safe thank you Okay, then thank you very much. And uh, I hope everybody has a great day then. All right, bye. Thanks very much, Raya. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you, bye, bye.